So good evening. Thank you for coming. We're really looking forward to uh, this evening's presentation. Um, uh, the Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill College has been in existence for, I think this is our third year, isn't it, Ed? And um, each year we seem to have better and better programs, so we're glad you're able to come and join us. Um, so Peter Dodson, one of our uh, esteemed advisory board members, is going to be the MC for the evening. But I just want to invite you to the next two programs, too, since you're here. Next time we'll have uh, Paul Knitter, a well-known uh, uh, theologian. He just retired from Union the uh, um, Theological Union, uh, Union Theological Seminary in New York. And he'll be coming from, I think it's Wisconsin, to, um, to speak to us about the new axial age that he feels, you know, is, is coming to be. And then um, in April, April 13th, uh, Christopher Pramuk, who's written the very best book about Thomas Merton that there is, is going to do an all day, um, uh, a day of reflection, I guess we might call it. He'll do a few different topics on uh, Sophia, uh, Thomas Merton's idea about Sophia, that he, he got this idea from the Russian Orthodox. So those are things to come, and we hope you'll all be with us. And um, I, now I'd just like to introduce uh, Dr. Dotson. <laughs> Thank you very much. Peter's a, 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 pale, a dinosaur paleontologist, but he's not a dinosaur. Well, I'm, I'm perilously close to being a dinosaur, but I'm not, <laughs> not yet officially a dinosaur. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, everybody. I'm 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 so excited about tonight. I've looked forward to tonight uh, eagerly for a long, long time. We we've, we've wanted to uh, uh, to uh, get our our speaker tonight, Scott Gilbert, uh, here to speak to us for the longest time, and we're so so very delighted. Uh, Scott Gilbert is a very very distinguished biologist uh, who is uh, recently retired from Swarthmore College. Um, he said he's not retired, he's rewired. So that's, that, that's splendid. There's, a, there's, there's plenty of life in, in Scott Gilbert yet. Uh, Scott Gilbert is a, a developmental biologist, uh, and um, uh, he, got his, uh, he got his BA from Wesleyan University in Connecticut, and uh, he studied both, uh, he double majored in biology and in religion, which was uh, there's there's much there's much on his uh, resume that uh, really leaps off the page. Um, he earned his PhD from Johns Hopkins University, but uh, while there he earned an MA in the history of science. So he's he is uh, he has never been narrowly canalized in his developmental pathway, <laughs> uh, to be sure. <clears throat> uh, he's um, he, uh, he's had a superb um, scientific career. He was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, and he is a member of the St. Petersburg Society of uh, Naturalists. Um, he, uh, he is an author of a very important uh, textbook in developmental biology, which has gone through uh, eight editions. Oh, it's the 10th. See, so, yeah, I took it off his website, but of course, websites are always out of date. <laughs> uh, don't look at my website. You, you, you would not find it a rewarding experience. But, um, so he's also a, <clears throat> a author of a textbook on bioethics and embryology uh, and a, uh, 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 a book on ev ecological developmental biology. Uh, so uh, very, very important uh, books. Uh, he's received awards, including the Medal of Francois the first from the Collège de France, uh, the Dwight J. Ingle Memorial Writing Award, and honorary doctorates from University of Helsinki and University of Tartu. I'm not even sure where Tartu is. Estonia. Estonia. Ah, yes. He's uh, has won the John Simon uh, Guggenheim Foundation grant, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, very many things. Um, and uh, in addition to <coughs> 
uh, his scientific uh, uh, endeavors. Uh, he's also a pianist. For a number of years, he played in a klezmer band, which is another thing that just left off the page for me. So he's, he's an absolutely fascinating man. And, and he, tonight, he will share his thoughts with us on wonder and the need for alliance between science and religion. I give you Scott Gilbert, my very good friend. Thank you, Peter. Uh, really, thank you all. Uh, Sister Kathy, the Institute of Religion and Science, the righteous remnant of Metanexus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, Peter said that, uh, you know, I majored, double majored in biology and religion. Little story about that. When uh, I told my parents that I was going to major not only in biology and religion, uh, we're of the Jewish faith, and uh, my, my father said, so you're going to be a moil? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you never know where your choices will take you in a liberal arts college, let me tell you. But I want to talk about the notion of wonder and the importance of wonder in realigning science and religion in a way that they can mutually support each other. And I want to do this in kind of in my professional role as embryologist. We hear from the psalmist, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But what is it to be fearfully and wonderfully made? How does one respond to this wonder, this fear, this yira, or of one's body? And so I want to go back to the source of the question, namely wonder. And I'll be proposing some hypotheses that link science and religion through wonder. And I profess embryology, the science of how one's bodies are made, a science that seeks answers to the great ancient questions, how did I come into being? How does sexual union generate a new life? How come I look like my parents? How come I have only two eyes? And they are always in my head. You know, nobody has eyes outside their heads. How do my muscles become connected to my bones? How do some people, why do some people have penises and other people can have babies? Uh, why can't I grow back my hand like salamanders do? These are big questions. And embryology is a profession where wonder remains an operative category. Reviewers of my textbook, reviewers of other embryology textbooks will ask, does the book under consideration capture the wonder of development? Wonder is actually expected in the teaching laboratory, and it's used as a motivation to learn the science. Uh, the French embryologist Jean Rostand said it very well when he wrote, what a profession this is, this daily inhalation of wonder. OK, now, as an embryologist, I'm privileged to experience wonder when I enter my laboratories. To see a three-day chick embryo with the heart starts beating, to see fertilized sea urchin embryos at the moment of fertilization where the activation wave of calcium sets up a fertilization membrane uh, that shows that the fertilization event has occurred. I, do, I have this in the laboratory, and as the eggs get open or as the sea urchin eggs get fertilized, there's a wave of, oh, wow that just goes across the room. I expect this. I would be disappointed if this were not to happen. But for many of us, wonder has become something we experience only on vacations or as a surprise. I would contend that wonder is a primary experience, the result of the mind encountering the universe. But perhaps only mystics can live in a state of perpetual wonder. For most of us, wonder has a short half-life. It decays rapidly into two lesser but still powerful components, awe and curiosity. And you see this in our English language. When you say, I wonder, curiosity. When I talk about the wonder of it all, awe. Curiosity, awe, both linked with this notion of wonder. So awe and curiosity originate from wonder, from curiosity. I will say comes the quest for truth about the physical universe and the testing of ideas against other ideas and against experience, namely 
the foundations of science and philosophy. From awe, we get reverence and gratitude that are characteristic of the religious attitude. So science and religion, let me hypothesize, both descend from wonder. Now we see this genealogy in fragments, and I'll try to put them together. When we look at the path to science, we see that Plato and Aristotle both agreed that wonder is the beginning of knowledge. Echoing Plato's Theotetus, Aristotle notes, for it is owing to their wonder that men both now begin and at first began to philosophize. And at the beginning of modern science, Francis Bacon said that wonder was indeed the seed of knowledge. Statements of wonder are not uncommon in the autobiographies of contemporary embryologists. But one of the most important, important statements of wonder that I know of in embryology comes from the medieval rabbi and physician Maimonides. He writes, a pious man of my time would say that an angel of God had to enter the womb of a pregnant woman to mold the organs of the fetus. This would constitute a miracle. But how much more of a miracle would it be if God had so empowered matter to be able to create the organs of a fetus without having to employ an angel for each pregnancy? That's my career. I look at how ordinary matter, whether divinely empowered or not, creates embryos, creates structure. And it's amazing. The biologist and poet Miroslav Holub says, between the fifth and tenth days, he's talking about mouse development, the lump of stem cells differentiates into the overall building plan of the embryo and its organs. It is like a lump of iron turning into the space shuttle. In fact, it is the profoundest wonder we can imagine and accept. And at the same time, so usual, that we have to force ourselves to wonder about the wondrousness of this wonder. <laughs> Yet I write about the molecules and processes by which the embryonic stem cells interact with their neighbors to create the precursors of the brain, heart, skin, and guts. This knowledge of how this wonder takes place does not diminish it in any way. Rather, in kind of a positive feedback loop, it makes the whole process even more wonderful. I'll quote Veronica Hagenman, uh, who's an embryologist. The amazing thing about mammalian development is not that it sometimes goes wrong, but that it ever succeeds. So wonder can give rise to curiosity, which promotes the theorizing and testing that is science. Wonder can give rise to knowledge. But knowledge isn't wisdom. One of the best distinctions between knowledge and wisdom I found was uh, knowledge is that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. Okay? Moses, Jesus, Siddhartha, Muhammad did not know the number of protons in a carbon atom. They would have failed the SATs. They do not know the four base pairs of DNA. Knowledge is critically important, but it cannot pass for wisdom. Wisdom is how to use one's knowledge to lead a righteous life. It is the framework of the mind and not its furniture. Awareness of the divine, writes religious philosopher Abraham Joshua Heschel, begins in wonder. For one degenerates not only knowledge, but also wisdom. He continues, quote, the beginning of awe is wonder, and the beginning of wisdom is awe. Knowledge is based on curiosity. Wisdom is fostered by awe. There are, however, really interesting examples of where knowledge and wisdom have to come together. And as a biologist, the dumbest story in the Bible to me is Noah. <laughs> How do you salvage the Noah story? Even if you want, you know, why should you even want to salvage the Noah story? Okay. The rabbis had to deal with this. Why do you salvage the Noah? What, what's important about Noah? Why was Noah called a righteous man in his time? Big question. One person answers, one rabbi answered it. It's because God had told him to put all the species of animals on the ark, and he had to know the feeding schedules of all those animals. He had to know what is right in order to do what is good. Whoa. 
Yeah, you need the knowledge to do the wise thing, or to do the righteous thing. And so uh, I think that, yeah, that uh, the Bible also teaches that, you know, the whole world can suffer for human failings. That's another big thing in the Noah story. But, uh, yeah, knowledge is not wisdom. Uh, but uh, what we have here is that you have this genealogy of both of them from wonder. And I think that this is one of the big problems of at least the 20th century, maybe the 21st, is the confusion of knowledge and wisdom, that they pass for each other. But wonder can generate curiosity and awe. From curiosity, one gets knowledge. From awe, one gets wisdom. And commenting on the number of times in the Bible where awe is pronounced to be the beginning of wisdom, Heschel claims that awe is the primary requisite of the religious attitude. Awe, he says, precedes faith. It is at the root of faith. And it's interesting because Thomas Carlyle had a very similar opinion a century earlier. But according to this perspective, awe is the principal attitude of the religious person since awe generates the reverence and gratitude that are critical for the religious worldview. Thus, one can affirm the following lineages from wonder. Wonder gives rise to curiosity and awe, curiosity, science and philosophy, or religion. And what we see in places like embryology is that the two do get combined all the time. But that's later. So surprisingly then, science and religion, instead of being antagonistic enemies, find themselves to be close relatives, grandchildren of wonder. And any fights between them are within the, the family, not between aliens with separate genealogies. What we call science and religion are just two members of the family, but I'll use them, and I'll use religion as shorthand for religious attitude. So what do we do with this newfound family? And here again, I think Heschel helps us by stating the problem in a stark manner. It is not a sense of awe, wonder, or fear, which is the root of religion, but rather the question of what to do with the feeling of the mystery of living, what to do with awe, wonder, or fear. Moreover, he warns, as civilization advances, the sense of wonder declines. Humankind will not perish for want of information, knowledge, but for want of appreciation, wisdom. The problem then is twofold. First, why doesn't our civilization sufficiently recognize wonder? And second, how do we respond to it? To answer the first question, we find that much of the decline in the sense of wonder might be due to the structure of our disciplines. There is in Western thought a fear of wonder and its power. The philosopher Mary Jane Rubinstein has documented that one of the West's most important philosophical projects has been the internalization of wonder into philosophy, making wonder itself an object explainable by rational thought. Wonder may have been the font of knowledge for Aristotle, but Aristotle claimed that after it initiated curiosity, it had to be jettisoned because it could be very dangerous in preventing us from realizing the better state of knowing the causes. Similarly, Rene Descartes, Francis Bacon also thought that wonder had to be jettisoned after it initiated the curiosity. So again, one important project, one that should be performed in science and religion, is to take wonder seriously and to realize perhaps that it is becoming endangered. It cannot be assumed anymore. And that leads to the second question, which concerns what to do with the sense of wonder, the sense of awe. The main question, the main answer, I think, is that the two warring descendants of wonder, religion and science, will have to form alliances. According to the model I'm presenting, both science and religion depend continuously on wonder and will perish without wonder. So science and religion must be allies in preserving sources of wonder. At the present, I think we have three enormous social sources of power, science, religion, and economic profit. And as long as science and religion remain enemies, money wins. It will create technologies out of science for the pollution of the planet in the name of progress. It will create theologies that conflate a person's worth with his or her financial worth. However, it's not hard at all to see how real alliances can occur between science and religion. If I were to ask you to imagine evangelistic Protestants with a serious sense of stewardship, 
allying themselves with evolutionary biologists for the protection of wetlands. Imagine staunch Roman Catholics making agreements with Planned Parenthood to protect the fetus by eliminating bisphenol A and other phytotoxic chemicals from the environment. This is not a hard thing. The, you know, both groups want the same things, you know, healthy babies and healthy families. They can work together. Yet this means dealing with the devil. But we can assume that it can be done. And it is being done. Being pro-life, says one editorial, is more than being anti-abortion. Stewardship and protection of biodiversity is certainly an area where science and religion can become allies. Okay, so that's the first part, just this notion of science and religion both coming from wonder, and they both need continuous wonder in order to sustain the scientific attitude and the religious attitude. So they should be allies in preserving wonder. I want to go into a little bit about Darwinism and the schism of science and religion. And I think that more people, well, most people when they discuss evolution don't know what evolution is. And I'm talking about scientists as well as lay people. Uh, I think people are against religion, uh, are against evolution largely because of the materialism involved in its contingency more than any scientific principle. Uh, the adjective Darwinian is often used in popular culture to denote competition to the death. And, you know, Evolutionary biology, very easy. There are four parts to it mainly. There's variation within a species. You look around you and you see, yeah, that's true. Most animals do not survive to reproduce. Yeah, if, uh, a fly, if two flies were able to uh, uh, have progeny which wouldn't, get, you know, which wouldn't die bet before mating, uh, they would leave over 20 billion flies by the end of the summer. Uh, those animals that do survive have certain traits that make them particularly fit for the environment. That's been proven a number of times. And the members of the next generation come from that group of survivors bearing the genes that produce the traits that made their parents fit. It's a fairly simple model for change. And it's been tested over 150 years, and it survived each change. Whether we look, And we can even now look at differences between chimps and humans. We can see evolution occurring. You know. Uh, uh, it's not a problem for scientists to talk about evolution, and it really is something. Very few theories last 150 years. Evolution is one of them. But the person who promulgated the notion that there was a warfare between science and religion in the Anglophone world was probably Thomas Huxley. He's probably most responsible, and I love Huxley. Huxley is a wonderful, amazing guy one of the most complex people ever to go into science. Uh, he couldn't teach. He was lower middle class, and he could not teach at Oxford or Cambridge because he did not have a degree in theology, because nature was God's creation. And the only people who could talk about nature at these universities were trained theologians. So Huxley took evolution and used it as a spear, used it as a cudgel to separate nature from God's creation so that he could teach natural history. He could teach about nature. It's an important, he was one of the people who was involved in professionalizing biology, taking it away from the people who didn't know physiology and who were, you know, the gentleman uh, scholars, people like Darwin. Uh, and making it into a thing that you could actually get paid for teaching biology. This was new, okay? Uh, and Huxley used evolution to separate nature from God, and so doing so helped start the paradigm of science versus religion. Heckel was doing a similar thing in Germany. But I don't think that either of those paradigms, you know, the original paradigm that, you know, nature is God's creation, so the only people who could talk about nature, you know, are people trained clerics. And that, you know, the, the whole notion of uh, natural theology, that science will support scripture. Or the paradigm of science and religion being in warfare works anymore. We need new paradigms relating the offspring of wonder. And one such paradigm might be coming from the mixing of 
evolutionary biology with embryology. And the paradigm suggests that evolution is not merely a competitive process, and that, matter of fact, competition might be the fine-tuning of evolution, but that evolution is primarily a process of cooperation, and that cooperation plays a major role. The living world is full of strange alliances. And just let me talk about two of these interesting new notions. One is that evolution is about changes in embryos. Embryos are what people should study if they're studying evolution, because that's where you get the big changes. I study how does the turtle get its shell. I get to study that. I get paid to study how does the turtle get its shell. In other words, I want to know how do 53 bones form in the turtle that don't form in any other vertebrate? How do you get this new structure, a shell, coming from a vertebrate embryo? What's changing is embryonic development, bone formation. Uh, when we uh, talk about uh, uh, evolution of the bat wing, how do you get a bat with a wing, a, a rodent, you know, basically not a rodent, but a mammal with a wing? Well, basically what you do is you don't, you, you, you don't uh, digest the webbing in its fingers, and you get the fingers to grow huge. Well, that's development. That's, you get the fingers growing large, you ha that's a developmental program, and instead of getting the webbing from its fingers, you keep the webbing there. This is all in development. And so when uh, 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 Mary, Claire, uh, Mary Claire King and uh, Alan Wilson looked at chimps and humans, they showed that the protein encoding genes were almost identical. But what was different was the timing and the amounts of these genes and the places where they were expressed. So Hughes and Kaufman say they were looking at how do arthropods evolve. They said, to answer this question of arthropod adaptations by invoking natural selection, Darwin, is correct but insufficient. The fangs of a centipede and the claws of a lobster accord these organisms a fitness advantage. However, the crux of the mystery is this. From what developmental change did these novelties arise in the first place? And again, this comes from Thomas Huxley. Huxley said, evolution is not speculation but fact, and it occurs by epigenesis. Epigenesis, the old word for embryonic development. It occurs by changing development. So, what we find is that by changing how cells interact with each other, we get new forms of life. We're not talking here about the survival of the fittest. We're talking about the arrival of the fittest. How do you get the variations? And so what we have here is a new way of looking at evolution, not as competition, but as how do the cells of the embryo arrange themselves harmoniously so that they don't destroy itself, doesn't destroy itself, and make something new. How does novelty come into the world? It comes about by cell cooperation during development. Second area of cooperation is mutualistic symbiosis. And I have a whole other lecture on this. This is, I think, well, Science News said it was the biggest story of 2013. Basically, we are not individuals. We are not individuals anatomically. 90% of the cells in our body are bacterial. We are not individuals physiologically. 35% of the metabolites in our blood are from the bacteria in our bodies. We are not uh, genetically individuals. We get we are ecosystems. We are several ecosystems. Uh, we get colonized at birth as soon as the amnion breaks. Uh, we are open for colonization, and the microbes that have been in the female reproductive tract colonize us. The, the bacteria that are in our immediate environment colonize us, and we have slightly over a hundred major species of <coughs> bacteria in and on our bodies. Are they doing anything? Yes. They are helping our later development. 
Mice, for instance, do not develop their immune systems without microbes. The gut-associated lymphoid tissue does not develop without the microbes being present. How does the, intest the capillaries around the gut form? They're formed from signals coming from the bacteria. The signals from the bacteria tell zebrafish uh, gut stem cells to, to divide properly. They do this by inducing gene expression in the neighboring cells just like the embryo tissues do. They're just like having embryonic cells. We expect them. We are not individuals by anatomical, physiological, developmental, genetic means. We are also not individuals uh, uh, immunologically. It used to be immunology had been thought of as our defensive weaponry against the hostile outside world, and this was hammered home to us during the HIV AIDS epidemic, that if you don't have a good immune system, you are destroyed, you are eaten. That's part of the immune system. But the other part of the immune system is actually to help the colonization of the good bacteria into the body. And this is helped by the immune system. So the immune system is not just a defensive weaponry. The metaphor I use are either bouncers at bars or really mean passport control agents. They know who to let in and who to keep out. They've been trained that way through evolution. We know which microbial you know, consortium to allow in and which cannot be part of our bodies. So we're not even individuals immunologically. And I'll also claim that we are not uh, individuals evolutionarily. I think we get selected as teams. There's a new, a new word. I'll tell you a new word today, if you haven't heard it already. Holobiont. The holobiont is the eukaryotic organism, like a, an animal, plus its persistent microbial communities. The, the symbionts, these microbes, give us genetic information. They are a third pathway. There's the nucleus, there's the mitochondrion, and there are the symbionts. And we get these largely from our mother. In insects, they get it directly from the mother. It's packaged into the egg. We have this new form of heredity, the symbionts. And in insects like pea aphids, the color of the aphid the ability of the aphid to tolerate high temperatures and the ability of the aphid to uh, uh, resist parasite infection depend not on the genome of the aphid, but on the genome of its symbionts. In humans, there are variations between symbionts also. We don't know if they're selective or not. But nature may select teams. Think of the eagles, for instance. Well, maybe not think of the eagles. Okay. The, the, but you can have the best quarterback in the league, but if you don't have people defending the quarterback or catching the ball, the team doesn't advance. And it's not the quarterback who advances, it's the team. And so this is what's important. I think we're seeing a new level of natural selection here, a selection of teams. I am Team Scott Gilbert, okay? Okay, now this is, I think, really important philosophically. Because this now means that uh, neither animals nor plants develop from a single set of genes. Each tree is an ecosystem. Each person is an ecosystem. Uh, the parable I like to use is the parable of the orchid seed. The orchid seed is even smaller than the mustard seed. The orchid seed is so small it can't germinate. Can't germinate. Needs a fungal spore. Needs a fungus to help it germinate. The fungus invades the seed and gives it the carbon resources in order to germinate. Okay? Everything is partnership. It's all partnership. So think about that in you know, religious terms. It's all partnership. It's all interactions between partners. Lewis Thomas writes, there is a tendency for living things to join up, establish linkages, live inside each other, return to early arrangements, get along whenever possible. This is the way of the world. Biologist Lynn Margulis and Dorian Sagan put it this way, the organism is the co-opting of strangers. 
the involvement and enfolding of others into even more complex and miscegenous genomes, the acquisition of the reproducing other, of the microbe, of the genome, is no mere sideshow, attraction, merger, fusion, incorporation, cohabitation, recombination, both permanent and cyclical, and other forms of forbidden couplings, are the main sources of Darwin's missing variation. Human beings are made up of interactions, as I mentioned before, you know, our guts, our immune systems as mammals are predicated on, on, on this. Organisms that cooperate best survive. And this is the new thing that has been discovered only with the most reductionist technology, high throughput RNA analysis, polymerase chain reaction. This allowed us to tell who the partners were. And it's just fascinating because the paradigm of entities forming themselves by their mutual and reciprocal interactions is a paradigm beginning to take shape in biology. In the writings of philosopher Donna Haraway, we see an ethic of becoming with. Instead of defining yourself against the other, we now have a biology of becoming with the other. This is really different. The notion, you know, instead of I against all others become I become with and through the other. And according to biology, this is not just metaphor. And I should say Donna Haraway, who I'm quoting here, uh, grew up as a devout Catholic, was trained as an embryologist, and she writes that the experience of wonder in both science and religion was crucial to the reciprocal inductions that shaped her philosophy. This new biology for uh, biological view of evolution is important because we humans tend to become what we believe we are. Again, Abraham Joshua Heschel. A theory about the stars never becomes part of the being of the stars. A theory about man enters his consciousness, determines his self-understanding, and modifies his very existence. The image of man affects the nature of man. So if we believe that science says that we are merely aggressive killer apes directed by selfish genes, then we might consider certain behaviors normal or natural, whereas the same behaviors might be considered aberrant or unnatural if we thought that science had determined that we were the current apex of a trend towards altruism and symbiosis. Science is saying that both competition and cooperation are critical. Indeed, if we think of ourselves as communities of several organism, organisms, Survival is a matter of cooperation. I think that this biological paradigm also can be co-expressed with religious views. The notion of an uncentered self becoming with others has, of course, been a major part of Buddhist thought. It's, you know, the sage Nagarjuna uh, finds that the world is composed of interactions and that nothing is. And he emphasized, quote, Things derive their being and their nature by mutual dependence and are nothing in themselves. This is Pradita uh, Yasampada, uh, various translated as dependent origination, conditioned genesis, dependent co-arising, and interdependent arising. Thus, any phenomena that comes into being becomes only because of the coming into existence of a phenomena in a network, mutual cause and effect. We see this in Western religions. These strands were all, always there, I think, but are now becoming emphasized. Uh, the former pope, writing as Cardinal Ratzinger, noted that in Augustine's parody of science and relation, quote, the undivided sway of thinking in terms of substance is ended. Relation is discovered as an equally valid primordial mode of reality. You know, can it be that Pope Benedict XVI is in agreement with the secular Catholic Donna Haraway who claims that, quote, the smallest unit analysis of analysis is the relationship. Uh, the writings of one of the leading rabbis of the 19th century, Rabbi Samson Hirsch, claimed, one glorious chain of giving and receiving unites all creatures. None has power or means for itself. It receives in order to give, gives in order to receive, and finds therein the accomplishment of the purpose of its existence. The Jewish toast, l'chaim, is in the plural. Chaim is a plural noun. Life, lives. I think that's very, very accurate. 
okay? And I think our biology has finally caught up with Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, theological and ecological vision expressed in the letter from the Birmingham jail. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly, unquote. And this widespread theological worldview and this new biological worldview, I think, are converging. The good, writes Heschel, does not begin in the consciousness of man. It is being realized in the natural cooperation of all beings. The natural cooperation of all beings. It's amazing. No cell could exist alone. All bodies are interdependent, affect, and serve one another. Now, did someone say that uh, you know, religion and evolutionary biology and couldn't find common ground? So I think here's a paradigm where Western religions, Eastern religions, philosophy, and science might be able to find common ground and be allies. Dep interdependency is the way of all flesh. And I think that where we see this is really, for the most part, in the ecology movement, in stewardship. I think that science and religion will have to become partners in some sort of symbiosis today if we are going to preserve wonder and therefore preserve ourselves, humanity, and a diverse living earth. Such interactions are occurring, but only very subtly, while most of the attention gets focused on the evolution creation debates, which I think is a real sideshow. The real action is occurring in conservation biology, and I'll make a hypothesis. The hypothesis is that the major arguments for species preservation come not from science, but from religion or morality in general. When one looks at websites for conservation organizations and looks to see why should species be preserved, the scientific answers are really vapid. You know, they're usually phrased in economic terms of what might possibly benef be beneficial for humans. Species, we are told, should be preserved because they might make an anti-cancer drug, such as Taxol. They may serve as unique food resources. They can serve as biological checks for other species. They are necessary for scientific inquiry. They may be critical for soil aeration and other ecological services, or their genes might be important for making products in the future. I don't think this really gets at the heart of the matter. Why preserve the mountain gorilla, the monarch butterfly, the leatherback turtle, or the horseshoe crab, the Bengal tiger, or the California condor? What can we get from the Muhlenberg bog turtle that we can't get from the common red ear slider? The answer won't be found in that above list of scientific reasons. I hypothesize that the answer really is a religious, moral, or aesthetic perception that humans should not totally wipe out another species to extinction. So I'm glad to say that in many of the, science, of the conservation websites, especially the general ones, one finds non-scientific reasons pr for preserving biodiversity, curiosity, beauty, and wonder. Some sites are even explicit about this. So, it's, it's really interesting when you look at these sites because two things can be seen there. First is there's this inversion of nature and humanity over the past 50 years. We are being called to preserve nature. When did nature need us? You know, you know nature never needed us before. Nature was a source of wonder and terror. You know, it's now weak and needs our help. This is what Bill McKibben means when he talks about the end of nature. Not the end of nature physically, but the end of this idea of this incredibly powerful thing that we call nature. It's not the end of organisms, but the end of this idea of this powerful, sublime, wonder-inspiring, and independent other. Second, the sites often identify species conservation as a religious and not only a scientific idea. So while I'm constantly angry at religions for their insipid attacks against evolution, I'm not all that dispirited when I hear that America is a spiritual country. The question, I think, is how to engage that impulse. I think that the agreements, disagreements over the origins of biodiversity pale in significance compared to the benefits of alliance for the preservation of biodiversity. Indeed, in the, the symbiosis model that I'll be applying, one of the things that religion can do, well, two of the things, one, it can motivate people for action, 
Science is a really poor motivator for action. And it has to do with speaking, you know, speaking truth to power. It's one thing if you know the truth. It's much harder if you say 70% of our studies indicate this or that the new model of climate change indicates that. Science doesn't deal well with truth. It deals well with falsification. It doesn't deal well with we have the truth. No. And so speaking truth to power is a really difficult thing to do. And so this is uh, one of the th reasons I think that you know, science and religion have to get together. Science can't motivate. Religion can. Also, science is really bad at making value judgments, or at least it should be really bad in making value judgments. Science can say that you know, Appalachian you know, mountaintop coal mining will cause health problems. It will cause biodiversity problems. It will cause you know, uh, loss of this, loss of that. But it can't say it's bad. It can document all the things that might happen, and it can give probabilities to them. But it can't say this is worth you know, 200 jobs. That has to be a value judgment, which is not coming from science. And I think religion, for better or worse, has always been making value judgments. OK, so the necessary alliances of science and religion. OK, uh, you know, uh, Whitehead said, when we consider that religion, what religion is for mankind and what science is, it is no exaggeration to say that the future course of history depends upon the decision as to the relations between them. So what is the appropriate relations? I don't see the appropriate relation as being a synthesis. I don't see any synthesis between science and religion. I don't see a takeover of science by religion or religion by science as a particularly interesting or valid model. What I see is alliances. Alliances allow the partners to keep their identities while interacting. Alliances need not even be permanent. Science should not be assumed by religion. Religion should be not assumed by science. Alliance. World War II's grand alliance, Britain, Soviet Union, the United States, was also called the Strange Alliance. Britain, the United States, the Soviet Union, I mean, <laughs> You know, we're talking about, you know, the most communist power, the most capitalist power, and the greatest colonial power in common cause. You know, Patton's notion that, you know, once we get to Berlin, we should, you know, turn the army towards the east, you know. Okay, uh, yeah. So I think that, that, you know, alliances between science and religion are critically needed if only so corporate interest doesn't reign supreme amongst the, the three forces that decides the future. Uh, I think that uh, the preservation for biodiversity or the stewardship of creation, whatever you want to call it, is going to be a place where they meet. And our stewardship of this planet has not been adequate. Within the next century, we can expect the extinction of half the animal species on this planet. Human population has exploded 2.5 times from 1950 to 2008, reaching a total of more than 7 billion people. And by 2020, it's, I believe, to be 9 billion people living in the unsustainable extremes of excess and deprivation. Uh, I mean, 40%, I work on turtles, 40% of the turtle species are in danger of extinction right now, mostly from habitat destruction. Overfishing of the oceans to feed ourselves is wiping out many uh, large fish species, bluefin tuna, will be functionally extinct uh, within the next 10 years. Uh, swarms of enormous jellyfish has taken over the ocean, bringing us back to uh, kind of an Archean epoch uh, in that, uh, that area. I mean, we're, we're witnessing, if you're talking biblically, you know, <laughs> the initiation of uh, tohu viboku, the, you know, the undoing of creation, you know, the... Uh, the con conversion of the oceanic regions from fish dominated to jellyfish dominated, that hasn't been seen for 500 million years. The large regions of the oceans called dead zones, you know, go back to the Archean, which is 2.5 billion years ago. So, yeah, there's scientific evidence that, uh, and I won't go into that humans are largely responsible for this, but I really don't care. I don't care if humans are responsible for it or not. There are ways, things that humans can do that we can stop the problem. Uh, 
But, you know, religious organizations have been hedging their bets. Uh, in 2011, Pope Benedict asked world leaders to reach a credible agreement on climate change since, quote, it is now evident that there is no good future for humanity or for the earth unless we educate everyone towards a style of life that is more responsible towards the created world. Now, that's not a statement that motivates grassroots supports. It's for support. You know, it's not like the abortion, homosexuality. This is, you know, we should educate people to live better lives. Uh, the representatives at the Durban conference made sure that their country's industries and ec economies were not threatened at all. Uh, besides, other influential Catholic leaders have been against the environmental uh, movement. Those of us who remember the 1990 Earth Day celebration when Cardinal Joseph O'Connor delivered his warning to say that he sh shouldn't worry about saving the whales and snail darters. The earth was made for man, not man for the earth. And uh, Pope John Paul reaffirmed that in 1995. Evangelical churches similarly split uh, uh, the evangelical movement's uh, day of prayer for the environment was not a real strong move compared to its other things. But and they, uh, the Heartland Institute, a foundation which sponsors annual international conferences on climate change to uh, uh, debunk notions of climate change, is largely an evangelical group. And at least in America, certain Christian religious groups are denying that human responsibility for these conditions and claiming that God would not allow humans to destroy the world. John Shimkus voted against bills to limit carbon emissions because, quote, God would not let there be such a catastrophe. Industry does not want taxes against its carbon emissions or limits to fossil fuels. Moreover, according to one religious high school textbook, quote, there is no shortage of resources on God's earth. The resources are waiting to be tapped. Okay. Rush Limbaugh tells millions of listeners that climate change is a hoax to defraud Americans of their liberty and freedom. I can't hear or read such pronouncements about resources and climate change without thinking of Isaiah and Jeremiah. Isaiah 3010, Jeremiah 28. Isaiah warns the Israelites of impending disaster unless they change their ways, but the Israelites don't want to hear it. Quote, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Unquote. And that is what the climate change deniers are doing. Jeremiah said that for the Israelites' disobedience, the easily broken wooden yoke would be exchanged for a yoke of iron. Change is going to happen, but the longer we wait to change our ways, the worse the consequences and the greater the cost. If we were to restore energy balance to the earth and stabilize climate by the end of the century, we would have to restore much of forest land and reduce carbon emissions by 6%. If we had started doing this in 2005, carbon emissions would only have to re be reduced by 3%. And if we delay curbing emissions until 2020, the required reductions will be 15% per year. And like Ezekiel and Jeremiah, James Hansen, and his colleagues at Columbia see this as a moral issue because the consequences of the stupidity of the elders will be visited upon the land and upon the children. Quote, the situation ra raises profound moral issues in that young people, future generations, and nature, with no possibility for protecting their future well-being, will bear the principal consequences of actions in actions of today's adult. It is a matter of morality, a matter of intergenerational justice. The injustice of one generation to all those uh, to come must stir the public's conscience to the point of actions. Science is warning, and I'm quoting Rudy Raff here, we are at risk of being our own assassins. So I think we need science and religion to get together, to get their acts together, and to mutually support each other's efforts in stabilizing the world. You know, to kunalum, to, you know, re to repair the world. Science and religion are the estranged children of wonder. But like Jacob and Esau, they do not need to love each other to form alliances. Science and religion need to form alliances to preserve the wonder of this world. They need to form alliances to preserve the creatures of this world. And they need to form alliances to keep alive the curiosity and awe that allows the survival of science and religion. And I think we need to do this now. Thank you very much.
Okay, that was, that was absolutely splendid. Very, very animated. Thank you, Scott. Um, so we, we have two respondents, and uh, the first of our two respondents is Faye Flam. Uh, Faye Flam is a, uh, a superb science writer. Uh, she received a degree in geophysics from uh, California Institute of Technology uh, and began her writing career with The Economist uh, and uh, has also written for Science Magazine. Uh, in 1995, she became a, a staff writer at The Inquirer, a science writer. And uh, she, uh, she wrote a column uh, for uh, several years called Carnal Knowledge and uh, uh, later uh, Planet of the Apes. Uh, and she gave us a reason to read the Inquirer every Monday. It was so wonderful. It was it wasn't just the reading about the Eagles on Monday. Yes, I agree. Uh, her, I, I, I treasured her column, and it's and uh, she ceased writing for the Inquirer in 2011. And as we all know, the Inquirer has become a shadow of its former self. It's just really a shame. And uh, her, the the departure of Faye was a was a great loss for. For us, there's no doubt about it. Uh, she's currently a um, a, uh, a resident, a, a writer in residence. Thank you uh, at uh, Ursinus College, uh, and so uh, and she's uh, she's she's collecting ideas for her next book project. Uh, so, uh, Faye, will you come up? For that nice introduction and I, I feel so much better after uh, hearing from Scott that I don't actually have to stand up here in front of you all alone that I'm <laughs> team plan <laughs> well in, in some of my previous talks I've uh, I told people that most of what I know about religion I learned from writing an infamous sex column and, and it is kind of true. You know, for, for many years, I was a science writer at the Inquirer. And for uh, about three of those, I wrote uh, a column called Carnal Knowledge, which was sort of a, a combination of, of science and sex. And I did quite often hear from uh, the more religiously oriented readers. And, and uh, some of them had some objections, sometimes objections to what I wrote, sometimes just objections to the fact that I was writing about sex in a newspaper at all. But you know, I, I saved uh, a lot of these uh, letters in files, and I actually learned something from about the sort of science and religion conflicts from, from looking at what people had to say. I also met Scott through one of these columns. In fact, it was a column I wrote about uh, the parallel evolution of animal penises. And uh, in fact, it was a column about something really wondrous, which is that uh, evolution endowed male animals with a huge diversity of different mechanisms for achieving basically the same thing. And um, I, uh, I got a lot of feedback after that column ran. <laughs> I think my phone didn't stop ringing for a couple of days. Um, some people, I uh, objected to it. Some people really liked it. And then I, I, I got a, a, a note from Scott. Um, I didn't know him at the time. And he, his, his letter was pretty positive. He said, you know, this is great. I really, I've been uh, reading these columns and I really like them, but, but you made a mistake, I'm afraid. And I, it was that I, I, there were sort of different categories of penises and I assigned the wrong one to one of the animals. I, I can't remember if it was the cow or the horse, but I got one of them wrong. And so I, I, I told Scott, um, uh, okay, well, we'll have to run a correction. And I think it was probably one of the weirder corrections that the Inquirer has ever published in its correction section. <laughs> um, and I also, you know, I told him I, I wish that I had interviewed him for the column, but I didn't know at that time that, that he was there. But he is exactly the kind of scientist that I, that I liked interviewing for these columns because he not only really knows his stuff, but he has a great sense of humor. And so um, I told him that... Uh, Next time uh, I was going to write about, uh, about genitalia, I would definitely talk to him. And, and that happened uh, quite often, actually, considering the subject matter of that column. Um, so I, I did, have, after uh, doing that column for a couple of years, I stopped. And I, I started another column about evolution. And, and I've also written a lot of stories for the front page of the Inquirer on environmental problems. Uh, global warming was one of the things I, I covered. 
And um, I, I really do agree with Scott that there is sort of a, um, there's knowledge, there's some, there, science can take you only so far in that it can tell us that doubling the amount of carbon dioxide, it, that first of all, that we are at some point in this century gonna double the amount of carbon dioxide in the air and that it will have a profound effect on the climate. But it can't really tell us why we should care. That, that comes from somewhere else, and that's true of a lot of other environmental issues. I just, uh, the other day, saw a trailer for a new documentary that's coming up. The documentary is about Midway Island, which is a, an island way out in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Ocean. And there's so much trash that's accumulated in this area that the island is actually full of albatrosses and the babies are dying because they're eating so much plastic that their systems are getting all clogged up. And, you know, science can tell us that this is happening, but, but science can't really tell us why we care so much. And, you know, I don't think religion really does either. I think that it's, it's, it's something that we care for a reason that's bigger than both science and religion, something that, that we do all share and some way that, that we can, can sort of form our alliance from the fact that, that we do all have this, this sense of caring about these other creatures. And I, I also think that, that we need to work together, that it's important for uh, religiously oriented people and, and unbelievers to work together. And I, I think that there are some areas of conflict and that it's important to talk about them, that that may help us kind of work things out. And in my experience in sort of dealing with uh, writing about evolution and, and, and kind of interacting with the community, I feel like one of the, the, the bigger areas of, of conflict has really nothing to do with God or the nature of God, but, but about humanity, about sort of what humans are, how we see ourselves and how sort of how we see our place in the universe. And you know, some people would, uh, especially when I was writing the evolution column, would write to me, and they they said they felt offended because they feel that humans really are separate from the rest of the living world. That we, we're we're not animals. We're different from animals. We're above other animals. And I think there was also a sense from those people that we couldn't possibly be messing up the planet on a global scale. That just couldn't happen because the, you know, the planet was sort of something that was given to us or we're, that we're separate from it. And really science has been in the process of sort of connect, showing, showing us that we are connected. I mean, Darwin showed us that we're blood relatives with other animals and plants and everything else that's alive. And genomics has backed all of this up, and not only that, shown that we are extremely closely related to some of our fellow mammals. And now, as, as Scott explained, this, all of this uh, science of, of symbiosis shows that we, we really are enmeshed in the web of life, that we are not only part of communities, but, but we are communities. At one point when I was writing the um, column about evolution, I, I introduced a semi-fictional character to kind of deal with some of these issues. The character's name is Higgs. I'm actually hoping to get him a new job. Higgs is my cat. The, uh, the, and he really does like to type. The, 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 the fictional part is that he, he types in English. The, the reality is he, he likes those function keys that kind of mess things up so you can't get your computer back to normal. But, but uh, I, I was sort of just inspired to think about you know, looking at evolution from another uh, branch on the tree of life. And um, Higgs, uh, he, he, the Higgs character was, was, was at times very wise, and, and he admitted that, you know, cats often see evolution as a process that, that must have been set in motion to make cats. Because what other purpose could evolution have but to make cats? And, uh, you know, but he's, he, he admitted that, he, you know, he, he and, and his fellow cats have kind of come to see that there's a lot of contingency involved in evolution. And so we're just very lucky that we live in a world with cats. And yet, both humans and cats have been known to wreak havoc on the environment. That, in fact, when, when people bring cats to islands and the cats go feral, often they can, they can cause uh, whole species to go extinct. So I, I thought I'd end by just talking about uh, 
a complaint or sort of an accusation I sometimes got from the more religiously oriented readers that they would often say, well, you, you're a materialist. They would use this label and it had a very negative connotation, you know, materialist. It sort of implies, at first, yeah, I think the idea is really, as Scott brought up the term, you know, what, sort of what you see is what you get, which implies that I'm, that I'm kind of boring, right? Because I just sort of, I just live in the world here and I don't really think about things beyond it. And it also, I think, has a negative connotation just because it sounds so similar to, you know, materialistic as in obsessed with consumer goods and conspicuous consumption. <laughs> but I think maybe I am a materialist, but in a very, very different way, in a way that was sort of inspired by uh, my opportunity to learn about science, and in particular physics, because if you learn about physics, you realize that it's not just sort of stuff and empty space, that that the closer we look, the more we find that it that space is pervaded by electric and, mag and magnetic fields, really an electromagnetic field, and this is all described by these beautiful mathematical equations that not only can predict the behavior of electricity and magnetism, but actually predict the existence of light, which is really kind of a, a wondrous thing that these equations predict that there will be light, that light will travel at a constant speed, and not only light, but a whole spectrum of electromagnetic magnetic radiation that includes radio waves that we can't see, but we know they're, they're all around us and they're carrying messages and news and music and all kinds of things. So we really are surrounded by all kinds of things. We, space is really space-time and it may have dimensions to it that we can't perceive. And, and matter isn't really just stuff. The closer we look, the weirder it gets. It's, it's not just sort of collections of particles. When you look more closely, the particles don't really have a specific place. They, they sort of spread out like waves and they behave uh, according to mathematics that describes waves. So I guess if, um, if believing in all of this and finding awe in it and caring about it makes me a materialist, well, so be it. I, I also sometimes hear the term humanist to describe people who are, uh, are not religious, and um, Higgs actually objects to that because he thinks it's a little bit chauvinistic. And I, and I kind of agree, there should be a better term because it does sort of sound like, well, you're just concerned with humans, and yet I think a lot of us are concerned with beings that just don't happen to be human. So I will just conclude by saying that I think that um, the thing that we, that, that uh, science and rel religion share is this wonder that comes from the world around us. And that we can both agree that this world is full of wonder and that it exists and that it matters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faye. This is great. Now, finally, I call on our very own Patrick McCauley. Uh, uh, Patrick uh, received his PhD in philosophical theology. He's no slouch. <laughs> uh, and, and literature from the University of Iowa. Uh, and um, uh, his BS was in communications and cinema production from, from Ithaca, Ithaca College or Ithaca? Yeah. Um, uh, he began his teaching career at, uh, at um, Westchester University, uh, and since 2008, uh, Westchester's loss and Chestnut Hill's gain, uh, he, he's been teaching uh, at Chestnut Hill College where he teaches religion, literature, and philosophy. So he wears many hats, and he's a, uh, he's a, his first book is Reading by the Light of a Burning Phoenix, a Kantian Interpretation of Hess. It was published in 2011. So he's a, he's a, he's a revered colleague and, and a member of the board of the Institute for Religion and Science. Patrick. Hello, I'd like to thank um, Scott and Faye for going before me so that I could, you know, get my feet under me before I walk up here. I'd also like to thank the Institute for uh, inviting me to speak here today. Uh, uh, I was reading through uh, Scott's work beforehand, and I saw all the neat uh, Hebrew Bible quotes, and I thought I'd be uh, cool too. Imagine my surprise when I find out I picked the one that he hates the most. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, for the students, my students who are here, 
uh, this will be funny for you, uh, but I've been limited to 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Dr. Gilbert... Uh, Dr. Dr. Gilbert's essay seems to be divided up into three major sections. In the first section, Dr. Gilbert addresses the conceptual or etymological roots of both science and religion. He finds the ground principle of both disciplines in the experience of wonder and its derivative concepts of curiosity and awe. He mentions in particular that religion is becoming disconnected from both awe and wonder under the weight of institutionalization and modernity. He then mentions that the evolutionary biology can itself produce the experience of awe for the scientists who regard it. This brings us to Dr. Gilbert's second section. In this section, Gilbert informs us about the amazing interconnectedness between cells and species at the embryonic stages of biological development. He explains persuasively that we are not really individuals but more teams of organisms working together in cooperation for survival. He then turns our attention to the pressing issue of global warming. Here he ties his essay together in his call for an alliance between science and religion for the purpose of responding to the demands of these environmental crises. He suggests that the issue of global warming is so serious that it ought to trump the partisan concerns of both science and religion. Gilbert seems to be waving a red flag so as to direct our attention toward impending environmental disaster. He seems to be suggesting that real and significant differences between scientific and religious mindset can and should be temporarily shelved while we address more pressing concerns as a cooperative team. What I would like to address in response to this has to do with the assumed motivational grounds. In other words, we must look into why organisms decide to do what they do. Dr. Gilbert uh, argues well for the cooperative model with regard to evolution in embryonic development. He asserts that we are actually communities of various organisms and that our survival is a matter of cooperation. He asserts this with a rhetorical force and directness, directness that commands our attention. This, work ex this works extremely well with his later discussion concerning survival on a global scale. If we work together as organisms to emerge, uh, to emerge uh, sorry, embryotically into cre the creatures that we are, then how difficult can it be to imagine that we could also cooperate on a global scale to forestall the looming disaster of climate change? If bacteria and cheetahs can learn to work together to perform the act of digestion, then surely religious and scientific people can learn to do that too. There can be little doubt that survival in the future will include a direct and serious response to the demands of global warming. The implications of greenhouse gases are indeed overarchingly important, and you will get no resistance to this idea from me. Recently, the Department of Religious Studies and Philosophy here at Chestnut Hill College hosted a conference on the issue of environmentalism and spirituality. It was held uh, June 11, 2010. The conference was held intentionally to address the overlapping concerns of spirituality and environmentalism, particularly with regard to the issue of global warming. A main theme of the conference involved the concept of environmental stewardship as a religious responsibility and calling. Another main theme surrounded the idea of the environment as part of the body of God to be treated with seriousness, reverence, and wonder. You can imagine my surprise. The conference drew people from all over, and yet it was commonly remarked that in the wider religious community, there are comparatively few who are interested in an overlap of spirituality and environmentalism. Many of us left the conference at a loss as to how to get the message out to what seemed like an unreceptive audience. How do we get beyond preaching to the choir? How do we motivate or inspire a voluntary and invested cooperation between the scientific and the religious? Dr. Gilbert raises the issue of, of the utility of the environment as a motivation to preserve it. He mentions many websites that assume or assert the point that we should avoid extinction of certain animals in case we might eventually need them as biological resource. In other words, we need to preserve the environment, not for its own sake, but as a means to an end. There can be little doubt that many, if not most people, interested in reducing the progress of global warming are inspired to do so by their own survival instincts. We need to save the Earth, not for its own sake, but because of its role as our incubator. This ground of motivation can be seen as significantly different from another point that Dr. Gilbert makes in, uh, involving wonder. Earlier in his talk, Dr. Gilbert discusses the connection between wonder, awe, and gratitude. 
In particular, he asserts that gratitude is a product of the emotions or experiences of wonder and awe. While there is serious room for debate here, it is not hard to see how gratitude born of awe and wonder can provide a glimpse into the value of the environment far beyond that of mere utility. It is not difficult to see that gratitude born of wonder can produce a responsibility for the environment born of seriousness and subjectively source reverence. This leads us to a very important question. Which is the more potent motivator, reverence or survival-based fear? Aristotle argues that motivation is the key to understanding the understanding of any relationship. In particular, Aristotle argues that one must know what drives a relationship for the absence of that drive or ground will bring about the end of the relationship. For example, Gilbert argues that the organism must work in cooperation in order to achieve the desired end of survival. He sets this in opposition to the more commonly held belief that evolution is driven by a competitive cutthroat model. His evidence in support of this cooperation model is really beyond refute. However, there is room here for discussion of what happens when Team Scott Gilbert comes in antagonistic competition with Team Patrick McCauley. <laughs> what happens when Team Cheetah enters into a relationship with Team Antelope? <laughs> Further, what happens when one pride of lion comes in competition with another pride of lions? In other words, cooperation is not observed under all conditions regarding animal, su animal su survival in the wild. Further, the cooperation mentioned by Dr. Gilbert does not often depend on the intentional participation of the organisms involved. If the, ground of if the ground or principle of motivation can be assumed to be derived from survival, then cooperation will only be sustained when it serves that end. As soon as a cutthroat competition is shown to better serve the intended end of survival, competition will then be selected over cooperation. Very similar patterns can be seen in business ethics. This leads us to a discussion of our understanding of the motivational ground for cooperation between the religious and the scientific. Gilbert seems to be suggesting that we ask religious and scientific community leaders to call their constituents to cooperative action in the face of global warming. Reverential awe and authentic wonder are sincere and delicate spiritual motivators. It is very important to regard one another's authentic spirituality with the deepest respect. It is extremely dangerous to endeavor to co-opt or direct the end purposes of an individual's authentic spirituality or religiosity. Dr. Gilbert seems to be calling the religious to come to an understanding in regard to the, regarding the utilitarian importance of environmental stewardship. We must see that this motivation has grounded on the desire for biological survival. However, not all spirituality is so driven or so motivated. It is not hard to see on any crucifix that survival cannot be assumed to be the end goal of a spiritual or religious journey. Dr. Gilbert comes close to making this point himself. Toward the end of the essay, he asserts the need for a new paradigm, quote, where Western religions, Eastern religions, philosophy, and science can find common ground and become allies. Inter interdependence is the way of all flesh, end quote. This is a familiar reference to the Hebrew Bible. In Genesis 6:12, we find, And God, looking on the earth, saw that it was evil, for the way of all flesh had become evil on the earth. This is part of the Noah story, which has striking relevance for our current environmental circumstances. There we find commonly antagonistic and predatory animals working in mutual cooperation in, in the face of impending environmental disaster. However, we must recognize that Dr. Gilbert's call to interdisciplinary cooperation is grounded on the desire for bodily survival. Being, being associated with the way of all flesh is not commonly recognized as a complement within Judeo-Christian Bible. In fact, as in the Genesis references above, flesh is associated with the tendency to corruption and temptation. I'm not disagreeing in any way with Dr. Gilbert's main thesis and call to the cooperation in the face of impending environmental crises. I'm simply calling attention to the importance of recognizing differences in regard to motivational grounds to action. More specifically, if you're going to endeavor to draw the religious or spiritual into a cooperation with the scientifically minded, it might be a mistake to assume that the desire for survival motivates them. Many of the spiritual type will not be drawn by a call toward the way of all flesh. 
it is important to see that the, motiv that the motivating principles of many religious people stand over and against biological concerns, not in concert or cooperation with them. Making a mistake on this account can undermine the very attempt to form the coalition that Gilbert desires. However, there, are, there may be an answer within Dr. Gilbert's own thought. Dr. Gilbert begins his presentation by addressing a common root to both science, scientific and spiritual mindset in wonder. In particular, he, success, he suggests that spiritual gratitude can find its parentage in both awe and wonder. As we saw earlier, spiritual gratitude born of wonder will often find its expression in either the reverence for the world as a manifestation of God's presence or in a stewardship of the environment as a context within which care for one's neighbor can occur. Many of Many who are religious will find their motivation in care and compassion for the neighbor or in reverence for the majesty of the divine. As we've seen, both of these motivational grounds can be oriented toward environmental concern. However, if any coalition between the religious and the scientific is to be possible, deference and deep respect will have to be demonstrated for these authentic spiritual postures. We must be wary of dangerous assumptions we must endeavor to find venues for respect and open civil dialogue between scientific and religious people so as to make possible a productive communication about often unrecognized motivational differences between them. It is only through such intentional and respectful dialogue that any practical coalition can be accomplished. The stakes are too high to do otherwise. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Patrick. <clears throat> now, I, I'd like to uh, uh, invite Dr. Gilbert uh, to, and Faye and Patrick mm -hmm. to come up, and uh, you can sit down if you like, and then we can, we'll spend a few minutes uh, taking questions from the audience if, uh, if you're willing to do so. So who would like to question the speaker? Yeah. Uh, I'll come with a microphone. Just a minute. Okay. So we, uh, so we can hear. Here you go. And I, I can pass the mic. I can uh, we put. Have one. Yeah. yeah, I can put the microphone over here so uh, you can share it as questions. Uh, you breeded, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, mentioned briefly economics, but it, it sort of comes into it. Take the example in California where there's this smelt fish that uh, is being, uh, you know, wa water is a big problem in California, and a lot of water is being held up uh, to protect this smelt. So p some people are going to be suffering, farmers and so forth. So what 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 the re religious mm -hmm. component would you see in this? Uh, is, does the religion come down on the side of the smelt, or does it come down on the suffering farmers who might go out of business, or people in California that are hard up for water, or people who suggest that huge amounts of money be spent so that both uh, the smelt and the farmers can be taken care of, whereas the poor taxpayer in California might again be suffer, so some person may not have as good an economic well-being for this. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that it's so simple a as you think when it comes down to having a religious component for the beauty of, na of uh, our animal friends and so forth. Well, yeah, I really do not have an answer for that problem or for the problems involving the salmon or, uh, for that matter, a whole bunch of turtles. But, uh, no, I, I don't think this is going to be an easy thing at all because it has to do with people living in areas with it where, you know, they are getting water by technological means, you know, by, you know, uh, taking water from other places. Uh, there's a whole lot of environmental justice here, which... Uh, uh, has to be dealt with. I mean, I think that we're seeing these problems uh, on such an interconnected area. Matter of fact, it, there was a, a wonderful example of this. It showed a text. There was a textbook illustration that looked at the effects of atrazine on gonad formation. Okay, fine. That was your typical biology textbook illustration. But uh, Tyrone Hayes took that illustration and made it the center of a whole complex network involving farmers, uh, uh, export people. You know, it all gets played up 
uh, into a human context? I don't have the answer, and uh, uh, I wish I did, but uh, this is you know, something that uh, I think the environmental justice groups are you know, wrestling with. And some, some people here, I don't have a monopoly on this knowledge at all, uh, who've been working on environmental justice I can jump yeah, in just yeah. a little bit. Um, uh, with regard to the, the, the uh, uh, environmentalism and spirituality conference that happened in this very room, uh, there was a lot of talk about that, about the question you're bringing up. And uh, the idea of religiously motivated stewardship uh, uh, can be very complicatedly discussed, but to a certain degree it comes down to a certain amount of leaving a smaller footprint and getting a little bit more humble with regard to the extent of your own impact on an environment that's already stressed. Uh, much of California, a place where I used to live, is, is you know, it, it's obscene what they're irrigating. You know, you live in LA, you, you don't have a lawn. Don't, just don't have a lawn. And so it's not just about a farmer that's, putting, that's being stressed because his water rights are being undermined. It's also the, the 100,000, maybe a million lawns in, in L.A. proper that are being watered so people can look at what they used to look at it when they lived in Pennsylvania. Um, and th there's a very, uh, it, it was commonly brought up, even though the conference wasn't directed this way, that Buddhism has some very, very specific ideas about learning how to leave a smaller per footprint as a religious action. That uh, I have a, I have a, a a, a couple that are, that, I'm, that are deep friends of mine who brag openly about the fact that they leave garbage for the garbage truck to pick up three times a year. They're working for two, right? Um, and, that's, and they see this as their religious, uh, part of the walk that they're, that they're performing as a religious action is that they're reducing their total footprint. They're trying to make their, their, their own impact on the earth as close to zero as possible. And I think there's room for, for wiggle room there. It's not just about this against that, but how do, how do you bring the concerns into a kind of intentional harmony? I'm not saying it's going to be easy, and it requires a lot of sacrifice, which Americans are not really that well trained to consider. Uh, but, you know, there, there really is an option there. Gilbert. Um, I've seen statistics that amongst those uh, in the science professions that biologists tend to be more religious or believe in God more than chemists who also believe in God more than physicists. <laughs> and on the other hand, on the religious side, there's different religions and different religious traditions who are more or less tolerant about things like the age of the earth or evolution or like that, so, and uh, Judaism in particular, I'm, I was also raised Jewish, is, um, modern Judaism is very concerned with social issues, and Judaism in general is not very uh, uh, obsessed with literalism in uh, interpreting the Bible. So you as an individual at the intersection of life sciences and raised Jewish, I, I can't presume about your beliefs, but do you think that gives you any particular uh, insight into this issue or maybe skews your view to the positive about the possibility of cooperation? Oh, it skews my view totally. Uh, now I think that uh, uh, there are certain uh, aspects of uh, Judaism that I find uh, quite fascinating and uh, only discovered as an adult uh, and these included a respect for uh, physicality which I hadn't realized before, especially uh, uh, the Yotzer prayer, uh, which is said after uh, a successful defecation, a urination. Uh, uh, what other culture has a prayer <laughs> that says, thank you, God, for allowing me to complete these tasks, and, if, and you have created my body with wonder and with the ability, and I know that if, a, if you, you have created my body with many tubes and valves, and if any were closed when it should be open, or open when it should be closed, I would not be able to stand here and pray to you this day. <laughs> okay, there are a lot of cultures with prayers for eating the intake of food, very few with prayers for the outtake. And to me, as a biologist, this is about metabolism. 
Now, metabolism, you learned in high school, boring, you know. Okay, metabolism is the most incredible thing that creation has. Metabolism, you eat, you poop. You stay you're the same. You stay the individual you are, using individual in kind of big sense, but you stay who you are because you constantly change your component parts. Wow. You keep your identity by changing your parts. That's metabolism. And this celebrates that coming in and it's leaving. Yeah, so, so yeah, they're, they're, I've been influenced uh, <laughs> by this. First, let me say how very much I appreciated your talk. I certainly do agree with the point about um, we must do better in stewardship. Um, uh, let me begin my comment with a quotation from Aldo Leopold. And it's a quotation in which he articulates a philosophical principle. He says, an action is right insofar as it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community, and it's wrong insofar as it does not. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, I'm considering an early part of your paper where from wonder emanate two lines of thought, one science, one religion, and then in my own maybe over-fecund imagination, I'm imagining a great many lines of development from wonder. And one of them is philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I th I'm sure you will agree, because we enjoyed such a nice conversation uh, at, at dinner. And I, I think I see where you're coming from. But in regard to the paper, it seemed to me that um, I wasn't clear about your thesis, whether you're saying that there are only these two lines of development, because I would have thought, maybe too vainly as a philosopher, that one of the rather important things that come out of wonder is philosophy. And that if we talk about that, then we can readily connect Leopold's principle to the whole development that you were talking about. But maybe more especially, we could think of different things that could also, other lines that could also develop. For example, art history, I would have thought. So in, please in, comment. In the actual paper, philosophy and art history are mentioned. That's true. <laughs> and so I, I, and I couldn't discuss them, but I especially think that uh, art and music come out of this. And actually, art and music are probably some of the two most interesting integrations of you know a kind of uh, you know, science and aesthetic, if, if you will. Uh, you know, music was taught as science, you know, back in Galileo's time. Uh, and, and so I think that that's a very important. Uh, also architecture uh, uh, and gardening. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I mean, gardening, using nature, you know, as art. Uh, I th there are so many of these. But yes, I do see thousands of radiations. But for tonight's talk, We'll, we'll, we'll do the, the okay. science and religion. Uh, something which I just want to mention from your comment, but it also relates to what you said, uh, which I think is really interesting. And I think it's, uh, uh, and that's, that's, you know, when Team Scott Gilbert's, you know, meets other teams and when the Team Leopard meets Team Cheater. Uh, yeah, we're not denying uh, competition. And one of the things that E.O. Wilson brought out in his book, uh, The Social Conquest of Earth, uh, was fascinating uh, to me as, you know, kind of a developmental biologist looking at evolution. And he said that, you know, the, uh, uh, in studies that look at communities where there are altruists as well as cheaters, you know, who, those who can get a free ride, you know, from the others, uh, the altruists do poorly within a community. But, when there's two communities against each other, the communities without altruists fail. And again, this is the old love versus duty. This is the old, what are the roles of the state versus the roles of the individual? Does the, you know, this is group selection versus individual selection. 
And what E.R. Wilson comes up with is that, you know, there are probably selection pressures for both. That uh, there's selection pressures for individual selection, selection pressures for group selection. Which means there'll always be great suffering and there'll always be great literature. You know, uh, this is th that dichotomy. And he says it can never be resolved in one, in favor of one or the other. Either you'll have complete anarchy or you'll have human society as antils. Yeah, it's an interesting, I mean, it's an interesting book and that's, I thought, an interesting comment that he made. I'd like to solicit a question from some of the students at the back. And would anybody feel like asking the question? Be strong, be brave. <laughs> <laughs> can you do it? What? I don't have any questions. Do you have any questions? Rachel? <laughs> Rachel? <laughs> yeah. All right. Anybody else? Maybe. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Students ask the most dangerous questions. Of course, yes. They're not socialized yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, perhaps, perhaps that's. Yeah. yeah. You can email me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah so. Could uh, I ask a question sure. for common conversation? Yeah. Is there any idea about how a discourse or, or a productive and civil conversation for the sake of global warming, how could you initiate an effective conversation between the scientific and the religious? I mean, that's the call, mm, yeah. right? Yep. How do you do it? What do you think? So important. How do you get people who are of a religious mind into productive conversations with people of a scientific mind for the sake of getting really serious about global warming? I mean, if I didn't answer, misunderstood that, I'm thinking of that all the religions and orders uh, live simple life. Ah. And I find, uh, I'm a secularist person, but I find kind of uh, uh, collaboration between science and religion in this point, which is all the religions, as I said, order the uh, live simple life, do less, uh, spend less, basically is an economic uh, translation of it. Uh, so we can watch our lives with the rational way. Well, I could say I've been very disappointed in trying to get uh, communities together. I, uh, I'll be a speaker at a meeting uh, in Italy concerning uh, endocrine disruptors in this coming May. And it's, uh, the meeting will be held uh, just north of Rome. And so I sent a letter to the uh, uh, head of the Pontifical Academy of Science, uh, asking if he or a representative would show up at this meeting uh, because it will be including the scientific evidence that there are compounds in the environment that need not be there and which actually produce abortions. Mm -hmm. I got no answer. Uh, and I've written him twice. Uh, you know, I don't know, and I know him through a friend, I don't know him personally, but a friend of mine, you know, knows him and, you know, uses reference and whatnot. No, so, I mean, it's, it's been disappointing, you know, uh, to try to get people together. I have a, a response based on what I learned from you, which is that I think the scientists have to step back and, and admit that they, they don't really own the, the, the issue in that science can't tell us why we should care about the consequences of global warming, that that's really a, a human issue. It's an emotional issue. And so it is something that we share. It's not something that, well, the science tells people that, that they should care about global warming. Science just tells us that global warming is happening, but it doesn't, it doesn't tell us about why it matters, or why we should put aside our comfort now for the future. I think that's, that's just something that's bigger than science, and so therefore maybe something that, that if the scientists sort of stepped back from it a little bit and stopped acting like they owned the whole thing, that maybe that would help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking that um, 
Patrick, after your question, and I've been so stewing about this myself just sitting here this evening, maybe, maybe this is a job for Catholic universities. And they're, they're supposed to have knowledge, supposed to have some wisdom. They still have some religiosity. So maybe this would be a, a job for, that some of them could step up to. Well, what would be the action, what would be the action step? Um, for example, uh, I work uh, in, in close partnership with another faculty member here on campus who's a chemist. Uh, and so we work together in an honors program. Uh, it's a very, it's a very uh, partnership oriented program in which we get together every week and put together a class that goes on for an entire year. Um, and it's a theologian and a chemist. But how many, how many university settings do you see the scientists interacting with the, human, the, hum, the, the people who do humanities? Yeah, well, there's also the question, what actually do they do besides you know, raise the consciousness on their own campuses? How do they, how do they have influence and how do you propagate that? Which one, the, hum, the humanities people or the, uh, the scientists? The universities themselves that I just spoke about. Well, how, what would you propose? I mean, I think that's the question that's hanging in the air. How, how do we get, how do we bring things? I think the point is we've got to get to the issue of global warming as a, I mean, you, you ended your, your talk talking, you said, look, it's, it's now. Right? We've got to put the brakes on right this minute. Uh, I like to think of myself as really cool because I have two hybrids, which both run 100% on fossil fuels. <laughs> you know, I, I'm <laughs> belching out tons of carbon every year, and I think I'm awesome because they're hybrids, right? Uh, and, and a lot of people I know who have Prius that go say, hey, I'm not the problem. Yeah, yeah. yes, you are. Yes, yeah, yeah. you and your Prius are the problem, right? Uh, just less of a problem than Mr. Tahoe over here, right? Um, uh, yeah, right. Uh, so how do you, as a person running a university, interact with the students who are interested in religion, you know, not just in terms of class, but in terms of the sisters or the brothers or somebody else who's on campus and, and handling things. How do you get that movement moving? And how do you get the scientific people out of, look, we're just scientists, we're just investing, we're disinterested, you know, we're just, we're just observing, we're just poking around. You know? How do you get them to, you know, go, uh, you know, it, it might get warm here, right? Or it might, there might be a lot more hurricanes or something like that. How do you get beyond the mere disinterested observation into a more engaged activity. I think you're right. I think the setting of a university is a place to have this conversation, and it's a shame if it doesn't happen, but it's still not as easy as, you know, there has to be action steps that are, that are easy to understand and articulate. Because no, nothing will change. As it's gotta be a, it's gotta be done in the political sphere. So you're not gonna get things to change until there's enough pressure. So you, you, have, to, you have to start somewhere. I mean, if, if you look at, say, the, 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 the civil rights movement and, and its connection to, to uh, universities at the time, or, or the, the anti-Vietnam movement and its connection to university at the time, the messages were exceedingly simple. Discrimination is immoral. You know, it, it's, it wasn't hard to explain what we were going to go march about. This is more difficult, uh, particularly if we take him seriously and say, look, we can, we can and can, we, it's possible to create a coalition between the religious and the scientific, but that means explaining the issue from two exceedingly different perspectives, and that in itself is complicated. So I, I propose uh, that we sell, uh, finance this movement by selling bumper stickers that say, we're toast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, All right. well, sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I just want to thank everybody from co for coming. Do you have something, Bill? No, I just have some small things to say. Yeah, um, who has it? It strikes me, I'm not even university. But it strikes me that until we begin to see the disciplines mingle and um, intercept each other so that uh, something like this would go through all the disciplines, and that the university would be teaching from that kind of comprehensive, collective, transformative view, everyone still being an individual and taking care of their subject and taking care of their information. And so we don't even present material that is related to other subjects. Now, you can answer me if that's accurate or inaccurate, because I'm not in university. But it's what I see throughout education, too. 
and on many levels. So how can it be a collective endeavor instead of individuals learning their subject, teachers teaching their subject? That's why our honors program is so wonderful, right? Yes, I have back heard here. of this, that program. We, are, we have an interdisciplinary honors program, and they're always learning two or three or four subjects at the same time. So we believe in that here. Um, and of course, it's not every student who is able to be so lucky. But, uh, but we do try our best to you know, do that at times. Yeah. Scott? I, 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 think, I think also that this is you know, the goal of the liberal arts college. In, in that it is, and you know, uh, there's a really interesting evidence, we were talking about it a bit over uh, dinner tonight, that some of the best training for scientists is in music and the arts. And that uh, so many of the best scientists were either publicly or privately uh, artists or musicians, and uh, that they attributed some of their creativity you know, or some of their scientific discoveries, not to just merely the scientific method, but to the scientific creativity, which, uh, you know, can span between music and art and literature and, and science. But I think that in the past, you know, at least 50 years, rewards for academics are given within the discipline. Promotions given by department. Mm -hmm. uh, awards given by the disciplines. Interdisciplinarity was something you did after tenure. You know, and it was dangerous to do it before tenure. Uh, it's hard to break those disciplinary boundaries down, but uh, in biology they are being broken down, uh, if only by technique. Uh, I don't think that you can have, in biology, those of you who are biologists, I don't think there's any subdisciplines of biology anymore. I think it's all syncytial. Uh, that uh, you have common cytoplasm, different nuclei, but uh, it's, it's, uh, but I think, you know, between science and the humanities, yeah, there's a lot of friction. There's a lot of friction due to, uh, you know, one group being able to get money and the other group not being able to get money. There's uh, uh, different ways of giving, of just the culture of each discipline being different. And I think that uh, this is something which some, some colleges are trying to get around, like, you know, having an interdisciplinary honors program where they will not allow a person to just graduate with kind of, a, you know, a boutique major, you know, and, you know, something with, which will be out of date in 10 years, uh, but with a whole knowledge of, you know, you know, the cultural em embedding of the science. We used to have something, I don't know if it was here, remember when there used to be Western Civ classes? Mm -hmm. That broke on the rock of multiculturalism and something, but uh, uh, but yeah, the Western Civ was something that every freshman had to take, mm -hmm. so that no matter what they majored in, you know, they would at least have they would at least have read a little Homer or a little you know Thucydides, whatever. I think that there is a movement now to try to replace Western Civ with maybe something more multicultural, but something which would give at least the freshmen, you know, before they major, a grounding in the society that formed whatever major they're taking. All right, so I, I think we will thank our speakers now. Definitely. And a wonderful evening. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. It's safe going home. And we hope to see you the next time.